I said, my name is Sue Shardlow. I am one of the co-organisers here at Ladies of Code London. We have four really great speakers lined up for you tonight. So before I introduce them, this is normally the point at which I would do the housekeeping in an in-person event. So I would normally tell you where the facilities are and the fire exits. I really hope you know where they are in your own house because I cannot help you with that, I'm afraid. If you hear the fire alarm go off, do not worry about us. Leave the building. <laughs> We're just going to carry on and you will have to catch the video on YouTube. So this series uh, is called Get Heard and it was inspired by Global Diversity CFP Day, which, as the name suggests, is an international event which is aimed at helping underrepresented groups in tech to um, apply to speak at conferences. So what we did was we thought we would run our mini version of this and um, provide them with the tools that they need to apply to speak at conferences and meetups to respond to, C to CFPs, which are called for papers. So uh, we just want to really encourage people that are keen to speak and provide them with a platform. Now, the Get Heard series is something that we were originally going to do in person and we had it all lined up for early March, but then obviously the COVID situation hit. And um, we weren't originally going to take it online, but then we ran a few events and we got to about 13 of them. We thought, actually, you know, we can run an online event. Let's try and modify it. So we put a bit of work in to modify it for the online audience. And tonight is the result of that. We've got four women who've come all the way through that four-week series. They only started four weeks ago with maybe a little grain of an idea of something they wanted to talk about and they've done really well to develop it into a full talk for you tonight. So just briefly the format of the series were, was that we did two workshops. The first one was to come up with a talk topic. A lot of people think that they don't have anything to talk about. We were there to tell them that is absolutely not true. Everybody has something they can talk about. Come up with a topic, a title and a bio because that is uh, stuff that you need to submit when you apply to speak at a conference. The second workshop was all about formulating the abstract, so really kind of fleshing out what you want to talk about, and also the structure of the talk and to work on the slides. And then we ran a number of mentoring sessions where folks could come about some ideas off everybody and practice their talks as well and get them as polished as they, as they wanted to. And now here we are. So like I said, I'm really proud. The people that are speaking here tonight joined our workshop four weeks ago and have come all the way through. Some people joined for the first bit and that was as much as they wanted to do, but these folks wanted to go all the way to the end and do a talk and I really admire them for that. So what they've achieved is amazing and thank you so much for coming to support them tonight. What's also really cool about this as well is because it's online means that folks from all over the world can join us. And if you were here just before half past, you will have heard that actually in our speaker line that we do have some international folks here as well. So tonight we have talks about code anti-patterns, how you can find and use government open data, why developers should care about documentation, and how to find and nurture your strengths at work. So now it's time for me to stop speaking and it's time for our speakers to start speaking. First up then, we have got Amy Boslam, who is a software engineer. Amy is passionate about writing supportable code. When she's not coding, she plays Animal Crossing, and like a lot of people do, and drinks a lot of peppermint tea. She's definitely British, that, that tea thing. Amy's gonna tell us all about some common anti-patterns and how to fix them in your Java code. She's also going to show us how to avoid anti-patterns in the first place. All the way from the capital city of Scotland, UK, here is Amy. Over to you, Amy. Give her a clap, everybody, use those reactions. <laughs> Oh. Uh, can you see my slides okay, yeah? Yes, we can. Go for it. Great. Okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Amy. I uh, am going to talk a bit tonight about anti-patterns, um, specifically in object-oriented code, so Java, which is what I write in every day. Um, so, I started my first uh, tech job in three years ago with very little programming experience and I've since learned Java, um, both on the job and kind of on my own further research. So I'm now the product owner on an L3 support team, which means that we handle the technical code level support and bug fixing for a Java product. 
once it's been deployed to the field. So um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about anti-patterns. Um, so what actually is an anti-pattern? Um, in software development, we have things called design patterns, which are generic reusable templates that you can follow to solve a problem. Um, an anti-pattern is um, a kind of design or solution implementation for a problem that actually ends up being counterproductive. So I like to think of them as bad habits. They work, but they have a range of bad consequences or outcomes that might not be immediately obvious. So they might work and then break further down the line. So I'm going to talk to you about three common anti-patterns that I've come across in code that I work on. So the first one I want to talk to you about is uh, magic numbers and um, magic strings. So um, a magic number or a magic string, um, you can spot that in your code because there'll be unexplained or unnamed numbers or string literal va variables in the code. Um, these are really bad uh, because the impact readability, um, it's hard to work out <laughs> what is going on in your code um, if the source or the purpose of a number or a string isn't documented anywhere. In particular for me, it means it's really hard to support codes where we don't have a clue where any of the numbers come from. Um, it also means that changing any of the numbers, you need to change it everywhere rather than just maybe in one place that it's defined. That takes a lot more time um, and it's a lot more expensive and it's also more um, risky as you might miss one. And um, that's how you introduce bugs into the code. Um, if you wanted to fix um, magic numbers in your code, I would say that you should define your strings or numbers in their own variables um, with good, clear variable names and comments to explain them um, if necessary, maybe for things like units or um, something like that. So the second um, anti-pattern that I wanted to talk to you about is um, lasagna code. Um, this is when you have large inheritance chains in your Java code. Um, for example, the largest inheritance chain I ever came across in code that I've worked with was um, seven classes deep. That meant that there was six extends in um, the Java code. Um, one of the, the longest in another code base that I worked on was four, and I think it's pretty obvious which one it would be easier to follow the code path through. Um, these uh, tend to be a bad idea um, because it's difficult to maintain. Um, tracking down bugs in code like this is an absolute, it's like navigating a labyrinth, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, and adding more features or new features is a lot more complicated because you need to work out where in the hierarchy they should actually go and also how any of the changes that you make would interact with the subclasses below it. Um, testing changes anywhere in the chain is also um, a lot more expensive because you need to retest everything involved. So say you want to make a change to this class, maybe do you need to really retest everything on all of these classes that might use it? Um, that's really expensive. So in order to fix lasagna code, um, I would say maybe don't design any new code like this pretty fundamentally. Um, it's often a sign of trying to generalize code too early and um, making it unnecessarily complicated. Um, this means that it often violates the Yagni principle, which means you, you aren't going to need it. So I would say don't add functionality, um, in this case abstraction, until you actually need it. If you're writing a generic superclass, it's only used by one subclass, then you probably don't need it. <laughs> but then if you've already got code like this, is there a way to improve it? So what you could think about is, does everything here actually need to be linked? Could you separate out unrela unrelated bits of function to avoid any unnecessary inheritance in the code? So the um, third anti-pattern that I wanted to talk to you about is a god class. Um, these will be easy to spot in your code because you'll have one god class that's massive and is referenced by all of the other areas of the code. It will contain all of the information, so constants or methods to pull in data from other external sources, and it will have all of the methods required for processing that data in it as well. This is a really bad idea because the code's obviously, again, a lot less readable. Um, I've seen <laughs> I've seen classes that are hundreds of thousands of lines long, and I'm trying to find out where anything in that is uh, linked together is really difficult just from a quick skim. Um, 
you'll also have uh, lots of subsection of code actually only accessing certain bits of the data or functionality contained in the GOG class and it'll be difficult to see without maybe deeper investigation what's actually used by which bits and what's impacted if you want to make any changes. Um, maintainability in uh, GOG classes is a lot more difficult as well because if all the functionality is concentrated in one place um, any changes could impact could potentially impact every other bit of code um, that means that fixing and testing things is more complicated and time consuming and expensive um, and you probably want to avoid it. So say you want to fix your God class. Um, the easiest way to do this or, is to split out the bits of functionality um, using composition. So for each bit of function, it only needs to have access to the data and methods that it actually uses. So the example I would give to you is if you have a single car class that contains all of your function, you probably don't need everything in that one class. So could you instead have a car class that holds a reference maybe to an engine class or a seat class and then have your seat class hold a reference to a seat belt class? And therefore, the um, functions contained in the classes that actually use it and everything isn't as interlinked. So. Um, yeah, so that's the three anti-patterns that I wanted to go through. Um, I would say that personally I've had to deal with problems related to all of these anti-patterns at one time or another in code and I can say safely that it is a lot better to avoid them starting off um, <laughs> rather than having to fix them later on. So if you are writing any new code, uh, please do consider whether you're using these anti-patterns and when you, you can um, avoid putting them into the code in the first place. Um, I would also encourage you that if you're interested to research uh, more anti-patterns, there are lots more out there. Um, there's an entire list of them named after different types of pasta, which was um, how I ended up interested in this in the first place. Um, I would also uh, point out the textbook that I've got a picture of up here called Effective Java, which is what I used to teach myself kind of more um, complicated but in-depth versions of Java beyond basic functionality, like thinking about things like is this the best way to do something. Um, and if you are interested, um, I also have a blog post written up about this talk um, that if you ever want to refer to anything I've mentioned, um, it's on there. And, uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you've got any questions afterwards. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Amy for that really clear explanation. I think even those of us who are not familiar with Java felt the pain there and we will definitely look out for that in future. That was definitely a lesson in being kind to your future self. And I think you told me that the code base that you're working on is older than you, is that right? Yeah, bits of it are over 20 years old. <laughs> you're finding quite a lot of these, uh, these goodies that folks have left you in the past, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so anyone working on legacy code will surely have seen some of the scenarios there that uh, Amy's described to us. And I hope that you have already had dinner because she also talked about quite a lot of foods there. And now I don't really care what is being made for me. All I want is pasta. You know, when you've got that thing and you just fixate on it, you know, I just want lasagna now. So uh, yeah, unfortunate. But yeah, great job, Amy. Thank you very much. So next up, we have got Sabahat Iqbal. Um, she creates data visualizations based on open gov data in emerging economies. She's also a tech community organizer. When she is not doing her front end engineering, she likes to dance like nobody is watching. Today, she's gonna to tell us all about how we can find open data and use it to discover what's really going on. Live from Washington, DC, it's Sabaha Iqbal. Go for it, Sabaha. Okay, can you hear me and see my slide? We can indeed. Great, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to my talk about rescuing data from obscurity. Uh, my name is Sabahat Iqbal. I live in Washington, DC, and I work in the international development sector. And very broadly, international development is about lifting people out of poverty around the world. So that's a very broad take on what it is. Um, as part of my day job, I work with a lot of data related to poverty from various countries. And despite the fact that I live in DC, I'm able to access most of this data because of a concept known as open data. 
So what is open data? Let's break that down into its constituent parts, starting with data. So we're all familiar with data. We deal with it on a daily basis from when you're checking your bank account to when you're checking uh, timings for movie listings. Um, but there are, very three, there are three specific characteristics we care about here. One is that the data we're talking about is not necessarily big data. So I know when people think of data, these days their mind tends to go immediately to big data, but that's not necessarily the case. There's lots of quote unquote small data that's still very useful. Um, the second thing is the data is publicly held, not privately held. So that means that the government is responsible for collecting that data and storing that data. Um, and if the government is responsible for it, that means the taxpayers pay for it. And that's really important when it comes to um, who gets to get access to the data. The taxpayers pay for it, they deserve access to it. Um, the third characteristic is that it, the data that's collected is related to the well-being of citizens. So for example, how many children are enrolled in primary school? What is the rate of adult literacy? These are all uh, pieces of data that uh, contribute towards lifting people out of poverty or helping us understand how to lift people out of poverty. Those are the three key characteristics we care about here. Open, um, it's not enough to just throw the data out there and say, yeah, it's open, it's there. It has to, again, fulfill three specific uh, criteria. One, it has to be technically open. That means anyone from a software developer like myself to a lay citizen uh, who just wants to find out more information can access the data. So for me as a developer, I should be able to access the API and pull down the data. For a lay citizen, that might mean they know who to contact, what department, how much to pay, uh, in, and in what format they're gonna get the data. And it's, it's good enough for them. Uh, the third, uh, uh, sorry, the second aspect of being open is that it has to be legally open. So that means the data is licensed in a way for both commercial and non-commercial use. The government can't say, um, we're just gonna limit this data to technocrats or bureaucrats or like maybe just these researchers and just these institutions. It has to be available to everyone. Um, and the third thing is the data has to be discoverable. So it's fine to put it up on a website, uh, but it can't be hidden in a link inside a link inside another link. Um, so, so if somebody does a halfway decent Google search for a specific type of data for a specific country, this first page of Google search results should return the data you're looking for. Um, and one of the ways the government uh, mitigate this problem is usually by creating uh, a data portal or centralized hub. So that's a key aspect of it. So what are the benefits of open data? Um, the more people that engage with data that government collects, the greater citizen participation there is, the deeper our analytical insights can get. And the deeper there are analytical insights, the better we can measure the impact of government policies. That's really important because the government is doing things to improve the lives of citizens. We should be able to measure the impact of that. Um, and ideally, that should lead to a more efficient government. That's in you know the best in the best world. Um, data, open data is often important uh, an important input for um, software developers, um, which is great because it usually means to better delivery of service, government services to citizens, but also jobs. Um, and ultimately it's important to note that we don't want the data to be siloed in their own databases. So it's good to know on the one hand what the historical poverty statistics are for a town, but we want to be able to layer that data with climate change models so that we can build a trajectory for the future of that town. Um, and just as a, an example, I'm going to show how I used open data to create something by myself. So if I was curious about the poverty statistics for, say, in my case, Pakistan, um, the first thing I had to do was obtain this data. So in my case, there was two ways to obtain the data. One was to go to a website from which I could download the data set, or I could request the form directly from the Bureau of Statistics. Um, the website right now is behind a password for some reason, which is anti-open data, uh, which is bad, but I was lucky enough to get the data before that got shut down. 
Um, so once I got the data, this is what it looked like, you know, pretty regular data set, ton, thousands of rows and, you know, a few hundred columns. So great, but not very useful as it is. So what I did with it was uh, start building data visualizations. Um, and in this case, you can see two of the visualizations that I built. Um, and it just shows a quick comparison of the rate of poverty in two different sectors of the economy, in the services and the ag. And right away, really quickly, you can see the relationship. One is inverse relationship, one is a positive relationship. So that's useful information to know, far more useful than this. Um, another example that's come up more recently is uh, there's been a bunch of news articles in uh, the newspaper, local newspapers talking about floods due to the monsoon season. These articles could have been copied and pasted ad nauseum from previous years. The same thing happens every year and the same almost it seems like the same article is printed every year. Um, I thought it would be a little bit more interesting and insightful to try and understand the reasons behind why the same thing keeps happening. So I decided to look at the budget. And when I went to the website, this is what I found for the latest budget. Um, you know, it's in a terrible format. Uh, it's just PDF, not machine readable, not downloadable. So in this case, I actually had to manually break, understand the budget, break it down, and put it in a format in Excel that could be loaded into my own code. So that took several hours over the course of a few days. But I managed to build what's called a tree map. Um, and a tree map is really useful for showing hierarchical data. So here we can see the different line items within the budget uh, categorized by different sectors or spending um, priorities. Um, so if we try to answer our original question about the monsoons, we can see the red arrows point to the expenditure for uh, debt repayment. And the green arrow in the, off to the right in a much smaller box points to the amount that the government spends on civil works. So you can see there's a huge difference between that. So this is just like a surface level question asking a very basic um, question about spending priorities. And this could be taken much further. You can look at you know, how has the budget been spent over time. Um, so this is just a good uh, way to get a quick insight. If anyone is ever interested in building data visualizations, uh, there's several libraries out there. Um, they're all really great. I use D3, um, and that's considered one of the tougher ones. But ironically, I found it easier to teach myself D3 because there's so many online resources. Um, but high charts and chart.js is actually easier. And there are several more available. Um, and so really quickly, I want to leave you with, um, you know, something uh, to maybe go and do on your own. Uh, I urge everyone to go to their local government or city council website, see what data exists, see what it looks like, what's missing, download the data, take a look at it, see what you think, and maybe do some uh, analysis too. Um, because public participation is really important to keeping open data open. Sorry. Yeah, so that was it. Um, so if you want, you can follow me and my journey on creating more open data. So thank you. Thank you, Sabaha. For dis demystifying open data for us, I thought I knew what open data was until I heard your definitions. So I'm really grateful to you. And also thanks for showing us how straightforward it is to obtain and do something with the data. What this talk really reminded me of was that if we all think a bit more critically, then we can uh, take some steps to improve our world. So where you had that data, you had a balance sheet with all the spending on it, we don't really know what the big spends are on, but when you actually look at it a different way, then it really, really jumps out at you. So thanks so much for showing us that. Uh, no thanks to you, though, for reminding us of food again. So anyone who hasn't had dinner and now has been told about pudding probably isn't thanking you very much. And those who did have dinner are probably looking forward to their pudding now. So now I just want to have the pudding first. But, yeah, Great job, Sabaha, and I look forward to seeing more of your visualisations in the future. So next up, I have got for you Isabel Costa.
Isabel is a back-end Python dev and she loves open source. She is also a tech community leader. She is passionate about documentation in software and today she's going to tell us all about why we should care too and how we can get started. All the way from London via Portugal, it's Isabel Costa. Go for it, Isabel. Yay, let's get started. Um... That's all looking good. All looking good? Yeah, okay. go for it. Okay, so first of all, hi everyone. I'm Isabel Costa, just as you said. Uh, I'm a software engineer from Portugal. I'm very pleased to, to be here to present this talk because I'm really passionate about talking of open communication and documentation. So first I want to clarify what do I mean by documentation. When I think about documentation, I think about, you know, uh, as a developer, for example, much requests with good description, issues uh, with good descriptions that I know what I have to do. Um, a readme of a project, a readme that I can take and run the project without having to talk with anyone else. Um, perhaps summary of uh, meeting minutes, right? We are in a meeting, we can take some notes. If that's uh, publicly available, publicly, well, within a workspace, uh, if it's available to anyone, uh, that for me counts as documentation. And then we also have open communication, which is a term that I started to discover when I got into open source. So for me, open communication is all about transparency. It's about having open conversations that most people in the team can access. Uh, for example, if you use Slack at work, uh, if you use public channels, you're practicing open communication. Uh, sometimes if there's a big Slack thread about the topic, I may use the search functionality to, you know, let's see if someone talked about this already. So now that we know this, I want to address uh, some issues, right? Uh, usually, uh, from my, what I observe in the developer community, often developers overlook documentation. I think they're usually not big fans of it, which I can somewhat understand because they want to code, but you know, uh, documentation is also part of uh, our work. Uh, and this can cause lack of documentation. And this lack of uh, documentation can impact people's uh, productivity, autonomy, you know, uh, getting things done more effectively and faster can be impacted if we don't have documentation to look at or if we don't have the necessary information uh, to work independently without uh, bugging someone. Uh, so, and for example, at, at previous jobs, I have encountered uh, projects without a clear readme which would take me some time to figure out how to run the project. And sooner or later, I would talk with a colleague and ask, hey, am I missing some configuration or something? What am I missing to run this? Um, and there's also cross teams communication. So uh, when I think about miscommunication at work, it can be you know, between colleagues in the team, between clients and stakeholders. And this can really uh, slow down the progress of a project. Right. Imagine if a decision is made uh, about a feature uh, in the end of a meeting, and then so, uh, that feature starts getting developed, and in the end, people figure out, oh, this is not what we thought we would get. Um, so, well, miscommunication can happen uh, in, in that way. Um, yeah, if people, people may think that they're on the same page, and, and they, then they're not, right? Um, so. I have a theory, right, from, from my experience, that I think that documentation leads to a more productive, more productive and autonomous individual contributors or teams. Uh, and also, uh, if we have accessible documentation and open communication, this can make for a more inclusive environment and team. So now let's reflect for a bit. I want to present two scenarios and think about it. Imagine you have workplace or open source. Try to not get distracted with so much text. <laughs> so at, at the workplace, uh, you know, you may have in-person scenario um, uh, or remote, right? Now, now with COVID, we're all remote, but you may not have remote. Uh, in open source, it's fully remote. You don't know who you're working with. Uh, you know, you don't have a fixed team, uh, team of members. You may not know the person you're talking to. Uh, and 
in open source, there's open communication by default and collaboration. Whereas in the workplace, you can DM your colleagues, uh, right? And you can solve problems within private messaging. So not always there's a transparent collaboration. I want to uh, focus on something, which is diverse set of contributors. What I mean by this in open source is that uh, you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know who you're going to work with. And you might have, uh, you know, you might work with people with disabilities, uh, invisible di uh, disabilities that you may not know of. Uh, maybe they have a cognitive disorder and they process information different than you do, in a different way than you do. Uh, or you can also picture, you know, a team full of juniors, mid, uh, mids and seniors, right? Uh, people will process information differently. A juniors perhaps perhaps need a bit more information around to um, to work uh, well and autonomous, autonomously. So uh, try to consider this uh, when you think about the way you work day by day and try to think, what if my workplace was sort of a work uh, open source environment, right? Um, so fun fact, bus factor. I don't know if you know this, uh, but this is, uh, yeah, the number of team members who if run by a bus, would put the project in jeopardy. So in other terms, because, you know, getting hit by a bus is, I don't know if it's something that happens every day, but, uh, you know, people can get sick, go on vacation, uh, a lot of stuff can happen, you know, uh, leave a company, that's so frequent, right? So we want to strive for a higher bus factor, right? We don't want to have one bottleneck of information, one single point of failure, Right, one person who knows a lot about a project, and um, then you ha if that person leaves, uh, how will the team continue the work? Right. So if you think about this on your day to day, perhaps you'll seek more knowledge, right, and try to also share more knowledge across the team. So now I want to address some challenges of documentation, right, um, which there are, of course. Writing documentation is like an art. In my mind, it's like an art. You know, I'm trying to get a better at it. I, well, I don't know. I try to learn when I have time. Um, but yes, it's not easy and I can acknowledge that. But caring about it is the first step for you to go learn it. Outdated documentation, this is also a common issue, right? Documentation gets outdated and that's normal. Code also gets, you know, in legacy mode. Code of today is legacy of tomorrow, right? Yes, uh, so just think about that way, right? And imagine if you write a readme and another colleague comes and tries your readme and that readme uh, doesn't have full instructions and we get it, uh, the colleague gets into some troubles throughout the readme. That person can help you uh, update the information and make it better. And there's also this question of what is enough, what is too much? Again, you can start small and then uh, open it for feedback. So what are the effects? One effect is autonomy, right? If you have information accessible to you, uh, perhaps you don't have to bother a colleague and take somebody's time to fix uh, an issue. Uh, inclusive, you can make up for uh, a more inclusive team, right? Imagine uh, the type of uh, team members that you might have, you know? Uh, at a workplace, you might know them, but in open source, no. So we, we have to, uh, try to make an inclusive environment and have different ways of sharing information. Uh, and if we document, that's a way for people to learn about the project, you know, asynchronously without having to uh, talk with someone. And for example, I, I'm a person who uh, forgets things a lot. So yeah, just, you know, think about it. I also don't trust anyone's memory. So uh, you know, think about it when you, <laughs> when you think about documentation. And productivity, this comes with uh, autonomy, naturally, right? For example, um, if you have documentation ahead of time of a meeting, then in a meeting you'll waste less, uh, less time perhaps talking about something which was already written somewhere. And you could start, you know, on Confluence, Wiki, or Slack, who knows? So what are the ways we can improve? We can try to provide clear descriptions in a pull request and issues. We can try to document important decisions, perhaps done in a meeting where no one, um, not everyone is present, uh, but we can summarize some points just to make sure everyone is in the same page. We can try to avoid private conversations. Uh, so if you imagine, if you use 
public channels, right? For something related to a project. Other people can chime in. Uh, you're not holding one person accountable uh, to help you, for example. Uh, and, and again, when I search on Slack, I'm looking for public conversation. And assume that this is responsibility of everyone in the team. Uh, it's not just of one person, perhaps that this person really likes documentation. Uh, it's responsibility of everyone to keep documentation in there. And also try to put yourself in other shoes. I think this also uh, always helps, right? Practicing empathy and, you know, uh, trying to think how, what can I do to help another person work uh, better? And thank you. That's, that's basically it. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. Thanks for reminding us how important it is to communicate. I think we all know that, but for some reason we don't always do it. And now we don't have an excuse because you have told us exactly how to get started with this thing if we're not doing it already. So thanks so much for that valuable lesson. And I think it's also, uh, it's also really easy to forget that the code doesn't tell the full story, especially if you wrote it. But having said that, I'm sure a lot of you folks here who are coders have gone back to code some months later and said, like, who the heck wrote this? Oh, it was me. So for that reason, I think it links in really well with Amy's talk. We need to be really kind to our future selves and our future colleagues and our current colleagues. And if we all did that then the world would be a better place. Sometimes we just need a helping hand with stuff. So uh, yes, again, with the bus factor I typed there in the chat that uh, it always makes me smile, even though it is quite grim. And uh, somebody else has put in the chat that they like to think of it as the lottery win factor. So if somebody won the lottery and left, that is a little bit less grim, isn't it? Although you would kind of hope that they'd share it with you and then you could all leave and then have somebody else's problem, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, great job, Isabel. Thank you again so much for reminding us of how important this stuff is. So last but not least, we are nearly at the end. I can't believe it. Last but not least, we have Anna Del Prete. She is a senior software engineer. She started in the back end and has worn so many hats over her years in software engineering. She is now a mobile developer. Her interests include machine learning, reading and running. If you ask her son what her interests are, he would say sleeping and drinking coffee. Anna wants us all to know how to find and nurture our own abilities. All the way from North London via Italy, it's Anna. Over to you, Anna. Hi, everyone. So can you see my presentation? We can see and hear you. Go for it. Cool. So welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Anna and I'm a senior software engineer. Nice to meet you all. I have been a software engineer for uh, more than nine years now and uh, this is a story about uh, what success looks like for me and how, um, how I achieved it. When I first started my career in software engineering, um, I was pretty much told what to do and uh, sometimes also how to do it from senior member of the team. So obviously, um, as I grew in the company, um, I gained autonomy and I started thinking how to go to the next level. So for me, the next level uh, was senior. How do I became senior? So uh, fun fact, if you look on the internet, um, you will see different description about what a senior software engineer is. And surprise, surprise, different companies have different description about seniority as well. Most of the time depends on the um, size of the company and um, on the um, level of expectation framework which is in place. So what I did was, um, um, listing all the qualities and the skill that I thought I should show in order to gain this title. And to do that, I, I thought about um, uh, a guy, because it's, most of the time it's a guy, isn't it? Um, that I was particular, um, how can I say, fascinated about. Um, so for me, uh, the guy is a critical thinker, is knowledgeable, is confident, is helpful, leader, trusty, communicative, people person, proactive, inclusive, and so on and so forth. 
and the list doesn't finish like doesn't finish like that list continues so i had this this uh, really long list and don't get me wrong i was really excited about it because i really really thought that in becoming that guy i would certainly succeed so what i did was uh for the following six months i tried to um, show this kind of skills and uh, abilities and every two weeks had um i i was revising this list and making some check so it was like okay uh in the past two we in these past two weeks i shown critical thinker be thinking because uh i spoke up in this meeting and i am um, enlightened an issue and i i found a solution and i showed that i was a leader because i started a design doc and so on and so forth so what happened is that um, six months passed by and at the end of six months I had my uh, performance review. And my manager was, um, was like, yes, you improved so much. And made a list of all the things that I actually had improved on. And, and uh, but there, was, there is a but. So the but is that um, the team, it, it told me the team feels that uh, you're not communicate, collaborative enough. You're not collaborative enough because you tend to monopolize everything, you tend to be on top of everything, and also we are not quite there yet. So um, I was a bit shocked, uh, and I still think it, it wasn't really fair as a feedback, but um, by the time I was completely burned out and um, I was trying to, to do everything and, and now there was also another thing to add to my list, which is ask for feedback, which is something that I didn't and uh, it's my fault. Um, so I just decided to calm down a bit. At the time I was working for a client and uh, this client was making um, a, a app which is very similar to Mood Nodes. I cannot specifically talk about the app, but I can talk a bit more about Mood Notes. So Mood Notes, for whoever doesn't know it, um, is a mood tracking app. So you have a very nice um, uh, face there, uh, a screen with a face that you can swipe up and down, depending on whether you want to track that you've been happy or sad or um, something in the middle. You can um, uh, define the percentage of your feelings. You can add notes. You can obviously track your mood for the day before, the week before, or the month before, and so on and so forth. One day, I was talking to my friend, and um, she's dyslexic, uh, and this is a very important detail. And she was telling me about um, her moods and um, the specialist she was seeing. Uh, I suggested her to use the app so she could also give me feedback about it. And, and I leave it there. One week later, I'd ask her what she thought about the app. And surprise, surprise, she hated the app. Screens were too crowded. The contrast between the colors and the written test made writing tests very difficult for her. The font wasn't quite right for her as well. So I started to browse the web seeking for information. And you know what? It looks like that the industry is more focused on the goal to help people to overcome their dyslexia, to start using everything for normal readers, rather than making the product more accessible for dyslexic people in the first period. So because I've always been a very inclusive person since I was a child, I want to, everyone to feel comfortable playing with me and I wanted to, everyone to be, you know, um, play with everyone at the same time. I just, um, I, I decided to become an advocate for uh, accessibility. So I push uh, for changing the font. I push for uh, having a feature, a speech to text feature and to use diagram, illustration, and chart whenever possible. And the result was um, pretty amazing, um, I must say. So six months passed by, and um, it was time for another performance review. At that time, I'd already stopped checking my list, so I couldn't care less about it. But the result was uh, quite surprisingly because uh, my manager was really happy and he was looking forward to tell me that the team was uh, happy me with my, uh, with my work. And surprise, surprise, I checked all the boxes without even uh, you know, considering it. 
So without even knowing it, I find my superpower, my strength. So me being naturally a very inclusive person made me succeed in the team. And the team gained a lot from me. So um, at this point, uh, and this is a just a story, and I'm just a storyteller now. But uh, what I would like you to take away from it is that um, try to emulate or mock someone else it won't make you succeed. Um, it will just make you feel um, or result fake in the eyes of other people. And uh, um, uh, I'll leave you with a question, which is, why do you want to be a bad version of someone else when you can be the best version of yourself? So, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I love that bit at the end. Why be uh, a copy of someone else when you can be the best version of yourself? And uh, it reminds me of that other adage, um, be yourself because everyone else is taken. Like, you know, just do, you do you. And thank you so much for giving us that valuable reminder. It's really easy to forget, especially when folks are telling you you're not good enough. And I think a lot of us have been in the situation that you found yourself in, where you were given the feedback in your appraisal and you thought that's not fair. And so many of us have been there. Um, and, you know, managers aren't supposed to give you any uh, information that surprises you in the appraisal. And a lot of managers actually fail at that. They should address it long before it gets that stage. And the best way of dealing with it is exactly the way that you have shown us. It is to provide them with indisputable evidence of the fact that you can do it. Just in case they haven't noticed, sometimes you have to show these folks outright. And I really loved your example of how you did that by uh, improving accessibility as well. I just thought that was absolutely perfect so yeah well done great job so like i said that was our last of our talks i cannot believe it that just went so quickly that brings us to the end of our summer short talks really hope you enjoyed them we have heard all about how to avoid and fix anti-patterns so i don't expect to see any anti-patterns from any of you good folks ever again and neither does amy she's going to come and check your code bases she's going to go for everybody skits hubs tonight we have found out how to find and use open data to look at our communities in a different way. What might seem obvious usually turns out not to be obvious. Look for the things that are hiding in plain sight. We've learned about why documentation and communication are crucial and some practical steps we can take in the right direction. And we've also learned how to make sure we're seeing ourselves as unique individuals and really bringing forth the contributions that we can make to our teams. So like I said, I really hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. If you did, have a look at our YouTube channel. The link is on our Meetup page and please share the link with your friends because the video of this evening will be on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks so much again for coming to support our speakers tonight. I'm sure they all really appreciated it. And thank you so much as well for using the reactions. That really, really gave everybody a lot of encouragement. So I thank you for that. So we do have a couple more events coming up this month. Keep an eye on our Meet Up page. Until we see you again, look after yourselves, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye. <laughs>